Welcome everybody. It's Katie with Thrive Alcohol Recovery and today I'm really excited to uh, be with Brian Noonan who uh, is the owner at SinclairMethod.org. He's a psychiatric nurse practitioner and as I know a really huge advocate of the Sinclair Method and as I mentioned to you before I hit record I've seen a number of interviews with you and I just think you have such uh, a comprehensive perspective on what effective treatment looks like for the Sinclair Method. So just want to start, first of all, Brian, by thanking you for taking time to chat with me. Yeah, I, it's, it's my pleasure. Uh, you know, I think it's always uh, uh, a, uh, uh, nice to, to meet people who are uh, advocating the Sinclair Method. And uh, I've actually had a few of, uh, of the patients I've worked with. Uh, the, they uh, have mentioned uh, you as kind of a source of uh, either the, the entry into the Sinclair Method world or, or some other type of uh, inspiration uh, uh, or, or beneficial kind of uh, relationship they have uh, with you uh, as well. So that's, uh, that's nice to, to meet you uh, and, and talk with you today. Awesome. Yeah, it's, I guess it's somewhat a small world, the Sinclair Method community yeah. world. We kind of all know each other, or get to know each other. So I was saying like, man, I've, I've known about you for years and I've never talked with you face to face live. So I'm really glad to have that chance today. Yeah. I wondered if you wanted to start by just telling us a bit about your history with TSM and like what brought you into using this treatment and starting SinclairMethod.org. Yeah, well, you know, my background uh, 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 actually, uh, I started in addiction uh, back in 2000. Uh, it just happened to be uh, kind of by circumstance or, or just happenstance, I guess, uh, that uh, I was at the uh, University of Georgia, actually, and uh, there just happened to be a, a position for residential counselors at kind of the old fashioned, uh, like a 30 day uh, kind of uh, you know, inpatient uh, uh, drug rehab uh, program. Uh, and I was I had psychology or I was pursuing a psychology degree, so uh, I uh, it was kind of a good, interesting job. And a lot of it, a lot of it involved AA. Uh, one of my jobs was to take uh, like a van full of people at the treatment center and uh, into the community, and they had to kind of go to one at least one uh, meeting in their home uh, ca county and so forth. So uh, it was kind of an eye-opening thing for me, at least. I mean. Uh, as far as just kind of really uh, getting involved uh, with uh, uh, the kind of the, the, the kind of conventional treatment. A lot of them were court ordered, that type of thing. So that was my first introduction into any type of addiction treatment and that was alcohol, but it was also uh, cocaine and uh, opiates and other types of things. So it was really uh, kind of an eye-opening experience. Uh, and it really was uh, basically after that, it was kind of the first professional job I had uh, and then subsequent uh, uh, jobs and roles uh, because of that. Then the next uh, position I went into uh, was also addiction because of that. And then uh, before I knew it, uh, that had become kind of a specialty of mine uh, uh, through the years. And then uh, I wound up uh, at Vanderbilt at their uh, nurse practitioner program there. Uh, and they have uh, an institute devoted to uh, addiction treatment. And that's where I did. Uh, I actually worked there uh, uh, in addition to kind of my uh, school, uh, uh, my, my academic uh, uh, requirements uh, there as well. So I had a lot of experience there. Uh, and it was interesting because I remember, especially in retrospect now, just kind of how uh, naltrexone uh, was thought of uh, at the time. Uh, it was interesting because it was kind of, uh, it really... Uh, it, it was something that we all were aware of, and it was on the radar. Uh, it was FDA approved in 1994. This was probably about 2005, so about 10, 10 years even after uh, it was uh, uh, FDA approved. Uh, and it was just really not given much respect, uh, but it was not given uh, much respect in a very uh, particular way that uh, now uh, it makes complete sense. It, it was kind of dismissed that it only helped uh, with binge drinking. Uh, that it was kind of uh, abstinence or kind of duration to first drink or some, some type of metric like that was, was really kind of how we thought of things. You know, how long could we keep the person uh, sober upon discharge or something like that? Uh, so to think, uh, uh, so it was kind of dismissed as, well, yeah, sure, if they drink, uh, you know, they, the, the size of the binge will be, will be less. And that was kind of that. And that, uh, you know, that was thought of as not worthy of even, uh, you know, per, per pursuing as, as some, or it being kind of a, a light bulb to, hey, well, well wh why is that? Why, you know, what is going on there? Why does it minimize binge drinking, for example? Uh, 
so that was my first exposure to naltrexone, and I never really thought about it much because we didn't really pre prescribe it that much or even talk about it that much uh, uh, at that time. Um, and so uh, later on, I work in various other kinds of uh, contexts uh, uh, with, with addiction, uh, alcohol being, being prominent. Uh, but it uh, wasn't until I started working uh, in outpatient, uh, uh, really it was kind of a general psychiatry practice, Ballard Psychiatry uh, in Seattle. Uh, and I was mostly seeing uh, depression, anxiety, sleep problems, ADHD, just kind of you know, these kinds of things. Uh, and it just so happened uh, that one day uh, a gentleman came in and he uh, wanted a refill uh, for naltrexone, which was sort of interesting to me because it was kind of like the first time I'd, I'd heard, even maybe heard of it uh, in, in some time. And I was like, yeah, sure, naltrexone, tell me a little bit more, how long have you been on it, this kinds of things. And, uh, and essentially he described the Sinclair method to me. Uh, uh, and, and I just, uh, it's, it's such a vivid memory of mine. I remember exactly, uh, you know, kind of the, the room, the couch, uh, everything about the, the situation, because it just kind of was such an eye-opening moment. And I uh, remember telling him uh, after he was finished that, that it really uh, was the first time uh, that I had heard kind of a, 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 dis a description or a solution to the uh, drinking problem. That made complete sense to me, you know. That everything that he said to me, uh, it just went down uh, perfectly. It was like the, you know the smoothest uh, kind of uh, encounter with my mind and all the things that I understood about the addiction of the world. It just it just made complete sense to me what he was saying, and it was you know it was kind of almost like how, which is a reaction that a lot of people have, which is how have I never heard of this? You know, given that it does make so much sense, and. Uh, and so, and so he, and he was doing great. He was just there. He, you know, did, didn't meet any criteria uh, for any kind of drinking problem, but he did drink occasionally. He just wanted his uh, naltrexone to take uh, as needed. And, uh, and I said, you know, uh, I, I, I'm going to prescribe this to you because it is just such a, uh, uh, you know, what, what you say to me uh, is, uh, uh, makes perfect sense. And also uh, his, you know, his kind of understanding of the size effects, very, very smart uh, uh, gentleman. And I, I uh, worked with him for a few years after that. Um, and he, I think he actually referred me to the uh, C3 Foundation. He was the first one to actually kind of, I mean, he, he seemed to, to really know uh, quite a bit about this. Uh, and, and that was back in maybe 2000, I'm going to say 2016 or 2017, something like that. And, uh, uh, and I remember uh, at that time, Claudia uh, reached out to me, Claudia Christian at C3 Foundation, because someone has suggested uh, they had a very, very tiny list of uh, medical providers who would do the Sinclair method. Maybe, really, it was incredible. It was like 10, maybe. Uh, but some, uh, and I think it was that gentleman or some, maybe the second guy I saw, something like that. But someone had told her, about you know that here's we found another pro provider who will do this, uh, and so then I got on that uh, their uh, their provider list, and slowly start, people started coming from uh, Portland, uh, all parts of Washington, all over the place for it, and it just uh, it was remarkable because the the benefits were so profound and so obvious uh, that it just quickly uh, it just became very very uh, apparent to me that. Uh, uh, this was was kind of the the, the going to be the, the basis for a new model, uh, a new way of thinking about this. And basically, every uh, patient of mine who had any type of drinking problem sub subsequent to that, uh, I talked to them about the Sinclair method, and then uh, developed uh, you know kind of a program at Ballard Psychiatry for it. And then eventually, it was like, hey, well, why do people have to come all the way from Portland for this? Why don't I just get an Oregon license? do telehealth and that's where the whole idea came from uh, and so it's and it's just been building uh, since then and uh, I guess you could say that uh, I have uh, just uh, complete 100% uh, kind of conviction and it's uh, utility as a first-line treatment you know so uh, so it's been it's been uh, just highly effective since then.
That's so awesome. And I love that your introduction to it was a patient because I hear sometimes from people who are telling their doctors about this and, you know, the impact one person can have by telling their doctor about this effective treatment is just incredible. And I mean, just seeing that it's made you, you know, as with SinclairMethod.org is like a leader in this space of treating people and reaching people across the U.S. So that's just really cool. Thank you for sharing your story. Yeah. That's right. I mean, I probably should have, I, I wanted to cancel the rest of my Appointments for the day, just have them, you know, like tell me, tell me more, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. It was just, it was, it was just a fascinating uh, experience. But that's, you know, it's not something like I said. The, the our exposure to it, uh, any really uh, published articles about it, the FDA approval, uh, the FDA approval about it, and all these types of things. It was, it was not something that was taught uh, in any academic setting. Uh, so, so a provider or uh, especially a primary care provider really would have not had any exposure to it. Uh, other than some type of encounter like that at that time. Wow. And things have changed rather quickly. I was introduced to it in 2017. So maybe, you know, I, you and I, you know, really hopped on board with this uh, around the same time. So I, I wanted to ask you, Brian, as someone who has been in the addiction treatment space for the majority of your career, it sounds like, um, and someone who's obviously qualified to prescribe naltrexone and treat people with naltrexone, would you say that the Sinclair method is a legitimate treatment for alcohol use disorder? Well, uh, uh, I, I think it's uh, it's it's uh, you know, the simple answer to that is a definitive yes. It, it's it's uh, it's it's what I consider to be uh, now uh, the first line treatment uh, for it. And I think if you think about it for uh, a second, you know, a lot of times, uh, especially, and I don't see this as much now uh, as as maybe a few years ago, but there, there used to be articles that would almost be kind of clickbaitish, I thought, uh, in the way that they presented it, uh, you know, that it was just about uh, drinking yourself sober and this kind of paradoxical, radical type of thing, uh, where, uh, uh, where really uh, it's, it's almost, uh, it's almost, it certainly isn't paradoxical or radical, and it's almost kind of boringly uh, uh, or, or uh, uh, simple and uh, and kind of established in, in terms of, uh, of of it being a, a operant conditioning, uh, you know the behavior of of, of alcohol is being rewarded uh, through these uh, endorphins, and uh, you take the medicine of course, and it blocks the reward, and uh, you know like any behavior. Uh, uh, where uh, you're previously rewarded and now you get, uh, you, you take that reward away, you're going to get less of that uh, behavior. So, uh, so I think uh, that's kind of the example uh, or kind of approach I take when, when introducing it to people uh, or to, you know, family members or anyone who might be skeptical is that uh, it's not uh, limited to the Sinclair method. It's not limited to uh, naltrexone. If you want to reduce any behavior, uh, uh, you're going to get, uh, uh, you, you do, you do that by taking away, uh, the reward for it. And I always like to say, uh, you know, if they stop paying you at work, uh, you know, eventually a person's going to stop showing up, uh, something like that. And so if you, if it's presented in a way that is just completely, uh, you know, something from your psychology 101 class or something that there are just hundreds of examples in our daily lives all around us, if it's presented that way, uh, uh, then I think it, it uh, versus some type of interesting paradoxical thing that, that we've, we've stumbled upon, uh, that this is a perfectly normal mechanism uh, by which you get uh, less of the behavior. Uh, so, um, so even on the face of it, I mean, just kind of that, uh, that basis for uh, of, of, of mechanism, uh, yeah, you could say it's a legitimate uh, treatment. Now, of course, do we actually have a medicine? You say, okay, well, you, you, you take away the, the reward. That, that's great. That I, I'm on board with that. But is there an actual medicine uh, or, uh, that will actually take away that reward? And yes, we do have a medicine that will actually uh, take away that reward uh, if you uh, take it uh, prior to drinking. Uh, so I think uh, it's, it's, uh, it's you know, certainly a legitimate treatment. Uh, and there's also empirical studies, uh, a lot of, uh, there are, uh, of course, the work that uh, Dr. Sinclair did, uh, but there have been uh, other, uh, many other studies, uh, random controlled trials uh, with a targeted dosing, uh, which is what Sinclair method is, you know, kind of drink uh, in advance or take your medication in advance of your first drink. Uh, so there's empirical evidence as well. So it's not just that it makes sense, which it does, 
uh, and that it uses the same mechanism that uh, we, we see all around us uh, all day. But actually, yeah, we have, we have uh, scientific trials uh, to support it. Uh, so, so definitely. And I think, too, one of the main things that struck me about it, um, this kind of first, you know, say first you know, 100 people uh, I, I treated with it, uh, was just that people were completely kind of relieved of this burden uh, inside their mind. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things about AA is that, yes, they might have X number of days without a drink, but uh, there's still a certain type of anguish or a certain type of torment or a certain type of uh, preoccupation that's going on uh, with the alcohol use. So it's just, uh, it's just amazing to have people come uh, back after a month or however long and uh, just describe it in terms really uh, that were like in terms of liberation you know like they were free of this of this uh, monkey that was you know that had been on their back for so long and that they had tried so many things uh, so I would say uh, not only does it work uh, and is it an effective treatment uh, but uh, the the type of uh, outcomes that we're seeing are even superior to what we had called success previously. So it's, it's almost kind of up to, up the, uh, up the bar in some way. Wow. That's, that's incredible. And yeah, you spoke to it so well, that freedom of just not obsessively thinking about alcohol. And I've had people reach out to me. I'm a year sober. I still think about drinking every day. And I know that was my personal experience. I can make it months and months without drinking, but I'd be obsessively, obsessively thinking about drinking. And that was one of the biggest things naltrexone and the Sinclair method did for me over time was just kind of quiet that craving. And when you don't desire something as much, it's really easy to not do it. So it's really awesome. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, and I, I asked that question, obviously, if there's skeptics out there, because with this treatment, you're still drinking and, you know, really speaking to loved ones of those who are considering the Sinclair method or who are using it. Um, what might you say to them, you know, if they don't quite understand this or the common thing I hear is, oh, it's just an excuse for them to keep drinking. Like, I want them to just quit drinking today. What would you say to a loved one who's in that place? And, and granted, I want to honor where they're at as well, because if you're a loved one, typically there's been a lot of pain, turmoil, you know, just difficulty helping someone who has alcohol use disorder. So I'm just curious, how do you talk with or, or support or explain this method to those people? Yeah, that's right. Uh, 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 a lot of trust uh, has been broken uh, often uh, in the case, or the, you know, the relationship can uh, be damaged, and the person, uh, could say the non-drinker will say, uh, is uh, you know at their wit's end, or they they really have had enough. Uh, you know, so they are are uh, uh, just kind of uh, you, you can understand their position as well in terms of. Uh, uh, just their frustration and, and uh, uh, you know, they're kind of, uh, maybe they've seen treatment uh, not work or go in uh, to a 30 day program and then the person's drinking again within several days. Uh, so, uh, uh, so there's that as aspect of it. I mean, I think I, I can really appreciate the position of that, uh, that, that person and, and kind of the frustration and, and why they would need uh, to kind of uh, have uh, this explained to them in a particular way. Uh, and I think, um, you know, I think uh, one of the things uh, that is helpful in those situations, um, that, uh, one is just to have the person involved with the appointment. Uh, for example, uh, you know, I invite, uh, I, you know, I want as many people as uh, used to be at the office as my, you know, my couch would hold or uh, as now it's uh, their couch maybe in their living room. Uh, but you know, I, I think that's really one of the main things uh, is because if there is trust broken, uh, it could be hard to believe that they are still allowed to drink or something like that, you know, that, that it might just sound like uh, that kind of hearing the Sinclair method uh, uh, kind of a second hand, uh, um, it might uh, not be so convincing. So I think just having an appointment with the provider uh, and just, you know, in my case, me kind of saying, yes, that is correct. This is how it works and da, da, da. And uh, the other thing I like to do uh, is uh, the uh, Sinclair method. And it's interesting. They didn't call it the Sinclair method, uh, but it was the Sinclair method. It was featured on NBC News uh, a few years ago, and they did like kind of like a 10 minute piece on it. Uh, so I like to provide kind of uh, NBC News has a certain stature to it. It's kind of a brand. Uh, 
uh, that that has some weight to it. And it's also short, it's shorter than one little pill, which is another good thing to watch, but the, that, that is kind of a more investment. Uh, this is about a 10 minute video. Uh, and there, there are a couple of physicians on there uh, kind of explaining uh, the rationale for it and just, you know, kind of seeing it on someplace like NBC News uh, adds a little bit of credibility to it. So that's the other thing I do is say, you know, please just uh, watch this 10 minute video on NBC News and, uh, and that can often uh, be uh, very helpful. But I think once you explain that, uh, uh, you know, that it is just a basic uh, system of reward and taking away the reward uh, and, and why it's important that you still have the behavior going on while you're not being rewarded. Uh, I think that uh, that's key. But I will say in, in that part, in the kind of the non-drinker's defense, it really is hard to explain. If, if you haven't had that type of kind of persistent neurological kind of uh, 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 obsession towards towards something that you know is 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 harming you, and you know that's not in your best interest. If you haven't really experienced something like that, it really is hard to to understand why can't you just not stop? You know, so so you really have to to really kind of uh, hold their hand a little bit and kind of appreciate where they're coming from. But most of the time, because it works, I mean that's the other thing. Most of the time, it works, of course, uh, and I think that's where the drinking log comes in. Uh, uh, I think the drinking log is maybe even more helpful for just the people in the, 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 the drinker's life uh, so that you can see that, yes, I'm still drinking, but, and still drinking a lot even possibly, uh, but I'm down, you know, 32.3%. And the number of these extreme binges have basically been cut to zero and that type of thing. So I think, I think uh, all of those things I just said uh, really uh, can go a long way, but ultimately it's, you know, it's kind of the proof is in the, the pudding. I mean, the person has to uh, start improving before they will fully get on board. Yeah, really well said. And I know, you know, with uh, Dr. Sinclair's clinical trials, it showed a 78% success rate. I'm curious, being in practice, what have you seen? I know you've mentioned it works. You've seen people it work for the majority of people. What have you seen as far as the success rate in your uh, practice? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, people mention that number, and I, I, I say that's probably that's probably pretty close to to what the number is. You know, it's something like that, where we, uh, you know, most people for sure, I uh, can say with confidence, you know, it's more likely than not uh, to work, and then probably it's even a little bit more effective than that, uh, where you know, I really expect uh, people to uh, achieve their goal. Uh, now, um, it. It's a little bit tricky, of course, in the outpatient setting. I mean, they're they're uh, or, or you know, kind of in a non-trial uh, uh, setting where you're controlling for various factors. It's hard to really know sometimes because, uh, let's say, a person doesn't show up, like you never see a person again. Uh, maybe they had kind of a Claudia Christian experience where, very rapidly, uh, they reached extinction. Uh, their goal was abstinence and. Not only did they never drink again, but they never took another naltrexone again, you know, something like that. And so, so they never show up. They, you know, you, you see them maybe once or twice, and you just never see them again. Uh, and and so you don't really know some of the outcomes. You don't really know, and some of the outcomes could be because they had a side effect or they changed their mind about taking it. And they wanted to try something else, or you know. So there is some percentage of people uh, you just don't know the outcomes. To, you know, and, and, and you can see, okay. Well, maybe that's 50-50, but even that is, you, you don't really know uh, kind of the people that don't show up. So uh, so it's hard to get uh, precise information, uh, but again, the 78% sounds about right, because even kind of with that in the mix, uh, you could say if I, say, if I see, uh, you know, 10 people, 10 new people a week that start on it, you know, I really would expect seven or eight uh, within, you know, some six month period to really have uh, some substantial uh, reduction in uh, not just the behavior of drinking. Yes, we're going to see data that shows some percentage in the number of drinks per week, but we're really going to see uh, and hear kind of descriptions of the, the, the drinking itself, uh, the role it takes in the person's life, the, the, the amount of mental space it takes up. We're going to see that uh, kind of recede uh, into the background as well, so that the person just uh, starts talking about things like, 
you know, it's not the first thing I did when I got home or when I learned that my you know, uh, wife was going on vacation, I started thinking about how much I could, you know, these types of things. I mean, you really just, or I never, ever like not finish a drink and it's amazing. I just, I knew I poured it and then almost forgot about, you know, and then I, the next morning it was half empty. You know, that type of, types of things where people just start recognizing that its grip is loosening. So it really is something like that. You know, it really depends on, uh, uh, you know, of course, there are lots of variables. I, I would say one thing that uh, it definitely does take some patience because a lot of times, uh, especially because uh, Claudia Christian's uh, uh, TED Talk is just so uh, widely known, at least, you know, kind of as, as an, in, uh, 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 an introduction to the Sinclair method. So a lot of the people who are coming to me, that's kind of their first exposure to it. And she had uh, a response to it that was fairly rapid. Uh, you know, it, it certainly is within kind of the, the range of responses we see, but I wouldn't characterize it as typical. You know, so, so if people have kind of that uh, idea in mind that they're gonna replicate, you know, exactly what Claudia Christian did, uh, then sometimes uh, they, they might be discouraged. So I'd say a lot of the success is about, uh, you know, understanding that it is a long process. That, or it can be that it that this is like you know four to six months uh, usually yeah i totally agree and that's one thing i do see with clients that i've worked with is you know if they kind of expect an instant result or the month or two and they're still not where they want to be it can be discouraging but to have those realistic expectations that this is you know going to take a while i think it helps people to not be disappointed if they're not seeing really quick results so yeah, I would say that's, you know, it's really encouraging to see that in your practice, you've seen the same success rate as he saw in his clinical trials. And I would say that as well. Um, I'm curious, when do you see naltrexone and the Sinclair method not work for people? Yeah, uh, so of course, yeah, it, does, it doesn't uh, always uh, work. And unfortunately, like I was saying, a lot of times when it doesn't work, it, we don't necessarily get good feedback on it because the person just decides to show up. And of course, we try to follow up and people who don't make follow-ups or miss their appointments or something like that. We try to try to get to the bottom of it, you know, what, what uh, you know, kind of what went wrong. Uh, I'll talk about side effects in, in a second or kind of adverse reactions, because that certainly is one uh, kind of reason why a person might show up, uh, uh, not have success with it. Uh, but in just, you know, I would say the main thing uh, is, is just taking it uh, exactly as prescribed, uh, you know, despite the simplicity of it. Uh, you're going to take this buzz blocking medication uh, before you drink. It really is hard to uh, to be perfect with that. You know that 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 something short of perfection uh, might really kind of prevent it from working. Uh, uh, that uh, that uh, you know, prior to drinking, uh, you you really have to to have this adequate blockade 100% of the time. Uh, and we know that uh, in medicine, just generally speaking. Uh, that's a, that's a very hard uh, task, uh, whether it be uh, a multivitamin, whether it be recommendations from a dentist to floss daily or whatever, you know, whatever it might be. I mean, it's, it's hard to really consistently do that. So, uh, so I definitely uh, uh, sympathize with, with people who uh, occasionally miss doses or, 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 or what have you. So uh, we really uh, focus a lot on uh, trying to uh, have strategies uh, to, to minimize uh, that so that's the one type of kind of thing why it might not work is because in some sense uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't ask much of a person other than to be perfect in this very kind of uh, this very uh, specific way. Um, the other thing is uh, uh, the person uh, might uh, just simply not be able to take it due to tolerability issues. Uh, uh, it's not that common that someone. Uh, just uh, kind of flat out could not uh, take it at some dose. Uh, uh, usually um, uh, there have been situations where we've had to uh, have it compounded, you know, get it to a compound pharmacy and really get a small dose of it, uh, which they're actually more, because low dose naltrexone, which is not really, that's not related to the Sinclair method as such, uh, but because that has become more uh, kind of a common treatment for types of like inflammatory pain conditions, things like that. Uh, so it, it's pr pretty easy to get it compounded at a pharmacy now. Uh, so a lot of times we can start at lower, lower doses, but people do have intolerable gastrointestinal side effects, you know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, something like that. 
or other kinds of adverse reactions. One of the things that's interesting too, it's, it's kind of wild to think about, but uh, 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 naltrexone, most, uh, most of the manufacturers of it, uh, I think there's only one, and I think that they may have uh, not even exist anymore, but uh, they all contain uh, lactose like the, as an inactive ingredient. Uh, so a lot of times, you know, it is important to know if you're lactose intolerant uh, because, especially if you're really hypersensitive to lactose, because the, uh, the inactive ingredient in uh, naltrexone uh, is uh, lactose. So that, in that case, you would expect some type of GI upset that was really independent of the, uh, of the blockade of the opioid receptors. Uh, you definitely want to take it with a full meal uh, because, you know, we think of uh, uh, these kind of brain chemicals like serotonin, dopamine, uh, in, in this case, opioid receptors, uh, all of those really are gastrointestinal uh, in origin. You know, most of our serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, uh, opioid, uh, most of those receptors are in our GI tract. And that's why all of those uh, really, uh, uh, you know, upset stomachs a common uh, problem. So that can be a problem. I will say to that, though, uh, one thing is kind of the standard uh, Sinclair method approach, if you read the cure for alcoholism, or just kind of even kind of the basic uh, approach that we have is that the first two days, you know, half a tablet, half of a 50 milligram tablet uh, with a full meal, you know, not just food. But I even would say that maybe even a quarter of a tablet uh, uh, the, the first time. Uh, most of the tablets I understand are, are, are pretty easy to, to break into a quarter of a tablet. And I, I would say that just because, you know, most people don't need to do that. Most people don't even really need to do a half a tablet, but you don't know if you're that person or not. So that's why we always really err on the side of caution. But I would say maybe even, even the first time we could spare, you know, maybe five to 10% of people uh, by, got, by having just a quarter of a tab of the full meal this first time uh, with the idea that this is a long-term program. So kind of an extra day or two where it's, you're not getting adequate enough blockade. I mean, that's a very, very small price to pay uh, to, to kind of increase the number of people who are going to uh, you know, be able to take this. The other thing is sometimes medications don't work, uh, uh, you know, whether it be a blood pressure medication, uh, you know, and we don't quite know. We're learning more and more about the way uh, that uh, particular enzymes uh, uh, are involved with the metabolism of a certain drug. Uh, uh, and so I think that's going to be handy more and more. Uh, there's a company uh, called GeneSight. Uh, there are a few of them, but, but for sure, GeneSight uh, that has naltrexone as part of their panel. Uh, and you can get uh, information about how your, uh, uh, your, specific, uh, uh, your, your specific enzymes uh, influence the rate of metabolism. So sometimes, let's say, for example, someone is a, a very uh, slow metabolizer. In other words, they don't really break it down. So essentially, the, the level of naltrexone is much higher than you would expect. Well, then that person might have side effects, but really uh, they could uh, do very well with just 25 milligrams as a, as, a, as a treatment dose. On the other hand, someone might be a rapid metabolizer and they just break it down very, very quickly, uh, in which case uh, they would feel nothing maybe and they would maybe need a 75 milligrams or a higher dose than average. So, uh, so there definitely is that where you kind of have to, you know, the vast majority of people are going to do fine with 50 milligrams. Uh, but uh, there are some uh, kind of underlying uh, genetic uh, uh, reasons that they might be metabolizing it uh, differently than average. So fascinating. So do you see in the future, perhaps people will be taking these tests to see, you know, how quickly they metabolize naltrexone so that the dosage could be right for them? Yeah, exactly. Especially, you know, and really an insurance company, or especially if you're talking about scale, you know, the, the types of information you get for one person yeah. Uh, it, is, it, it, can, it, it can be beneficial. It kind of takes like a, it makes it a better educated guess. You know, in other words, the odds are slightly more in your favor. But if you're talking about like say an insurance company that has, you know, 10,000 members or a hospital that has thousands of admissions uh, and you do this type of testing across a large population, then uh, you're really going to see that, uh, you know, the, the, that, that, uh, that it really can make a big difference. We, there are certain SSRIs, which are like, you know, Prozac and Zoloft and these types of meds for depression and anxiety. Uh, certain people have, uh, the way their enzymes, uh, they, it's just not going to work for them. I mean, it's just a complete waste of time to, to prescribe it. 
or they're very, very slow metabolizers. And if you start them at the normal dose, they're going to, you know, be vomiting or whatever. So, you know, if you knew that, then you wouldn't have to go through this whole sequence of types of things. So, but that for sure, uh, I think it, it seems inevitable that it would, uh, it would uh, uh, just be almost kind of a standard medical thing that you have here. Uh, these these DNA tests and they tell you, you know, right now they re it's really about the, kind of the rate of metabolism. It tells you, kind of, you know, are you a normal metabolizer? Do you have these particular enzymes that are associated with, you know, efficacy or not? But I think uh, more and more uh, you will see that uh, it it just really uh, instead of going through th you know three or four different antidepressants you can make it one or two with this type of information, you know, something like that. Like you improve the situation and probably uh, who knows? I mean, one of the kind of things about naltrexone that is often talked about is the fact that it is generic and that there aren't uh, kind of financial incentives uh, to find out certain things about it uh, that there might otherwise be. Uh, but if you think, uh, of, of say something like antidepressants, uh, you know, uh, they, they are different, like say SSRIs like Prozac and Zoloft and Paxil and Lexapro, those, uh, those are the common ones. Uh, you know, they're, they're essentially what we say, well, there's, they, there's one particular way they work, but they, they are slightly different. There are variations on the same theme. And some of them work for some people and some, well, you know, and, uh, so you could find something like that where you have these opioid antagonists uh, like naltrexone, uh, but it's slightly different. It's slightly metabolized in this particular way or, or the way it, uh, you know, uh, its obstruction of this particular uh, receptor is slightly different in, in that it, you know, translates into some percentage of people working in a different way. Uh, so that's one thing is that we only really have, you know, I, I think uh, at some point if, if there is some financial uh, incentive to do so, we might have several variations on the same theme. Uh, and then that small subgroup of people uh, who, for, you know, it's currently not working for, uh, we would be able to kind of uh, bring them into the, to, to the fold uh, uh, as well. But, but, but the basic idea that we need to block the, the reward for this, I mean, that's just going to be true. Uh, and then it's just finding these kind of safe chemical ways to do that. Yeah. So helpful. And I, I wanted to go back real quick to the side effects you were talking about, because the common few that I hear, I just wonder if you could speak to these ones. Um, people want to know, will naltrexone impact my mood? Does it impact my sex drive or other pleasures in general? Uh, so there, I guess there are kind of two basic answers to that. Well, I guess there's one basic answer. It, it's all, all of those are possible. So, so uh, uh, I guess I'll, I'll talk about mood first. So, uh, so oftentimes that's probably the most common question I would say uh, uh, is, uh, you know, I taking this, uh, this medication is gonna block my endorphins. I have more endorphins released with food, sex, running, all these other kinds of things. Uh, you know, what, what about that? Uh, so that's, that's one of the most common concerns. And uh, it, it, it's a, it's a good question, you know, so, so that's, there, there is a reason to think that that might happen to, to you if you take naltrexone. Now, the exact percentage, uh, it's hard to say, and, and even if, if we knew the exact percentage, we could say like, you know, 30%, uh, 30% of people, and that'd actually be high, even the GI upset's only about 15 to 20%. So, but let's just say, you know, it happens to 30% of people. They have some sort of uh, uh, negative uh, effect on their mood. Uh, you know, of course, that still wouldn't tell you anything about the individual. You know, it's like I I want to know if I Brian, you know, if this is going to happen to me when I take this. Uh, you're, you're still kind of thinking in probabilities. Uh, so, but it but it's always worth uh, uh, considering that that is a possible uh, a side effect. So I think it is important for people to realize, yeah, this this could possibly happen. Uh, but I will say it, it most likely won't happen. And when it does happen, there's a couple of things. One is it, it's not usually at 50 milligrams. You know, most people are at, uh, you know, I mean, that's kind of the dose. That's kind of the, the universal dose for Sinclair method is 50 milligrams. So it doesn't usually happen that. If we see it, uh, and I'll tell you exactly what, what the it is in just a second, but if we do see that uh, uh, kind of re reduction in, in mood or enthusiasm, uh, it's usually at 75 or 100 milligrams. In other words, it's at these higher doses. So, so uh, you know, 
most people are going to take the standard dose. You're, you're probably not going to see it. Uh, when we do see it, it's usually not uh, depression. It's, it's not usually that, say, naltrexone makes someone depressed. It's more like, uh, let's say, a flattening, like kind of an emotional flattening, a dulling, uh, a kind of a reduction in enthusiasm. You know, some particular activity used to be an eight out of 10, and now it's a six out of 10, you know, something like that. So it's not an across the board, the person doesn't enjoy life, they're uh, suicidal even, or so, you know, some, some, it's not really depression as much as it is just like flattening, a lack of enthusiasm, sort of a, like a dull gray day or something like that, you know, kind of the sheen is taking, taking off some of these uh, activities. Uh, so we can see that sometimes so for sure. One of the things too, remember though, like and, and running is kind of like the, the famous one just because it's called runner's high. We, you know, we actually have a name for it uh, when you have these endorphins released. Uh, one interesting thing, uh, well, it's true generally that uh, endorphins are not the only chemical involved with reinforcement. In other words, uh, when we are reinforced, uh, uh, essentially encouraged to repeat uh, these uh, particular behaviors, uh, it's rare that, uh, and I'm not aware of any, we're just, just solely just an issue uh, of endorphins. You know, of course, in runner's high, we're learning uh, that the uh, endogenous uh, cannabinoid system uh, is highly involved with, with running. So you're essentially having, you know, the, the, your natural cannabis uh, being released as part of a reward. And of course, you have adrenaline, and then of course, you just have the uh, psychological satisfaction. So there are all kinds of things like for running that even if you did not receive uh, these particular uh, endorphins, you know, it would still be a, uh, a rewarding experience. But I think the main thing, uh, well, a couple of things, I guess there are two main things. One is that it's always important to remember and to kind of think about treatment in terms of kind of, you know, uh, beginning, the kind of the beginning uh, treatment and then kind of maintenance, long run treatment. You know, if you're a daily drinker, yes, you might be probably going to if you're a daily drinker, for sure, you're going to be taking it every single day. So at the beginning of treatment, you're going to be taking this naltrexone a lot more. Uh, by month three, by month six, by year one, you're you know, going down the road, uh, you're just really, you know, the idea is that you're just really not, you're not going to be taking this, uh, uh, certainly not on a daily basis, but in a, on an as-needed basis. So if it is something that you experience, this kind of emotional flattening, uh, it's not going to be a daily thing that you have to endure. It's not something, uh, you know, it might be a short-term problem at the beginning, but it's not going to be something that you have to, to live with, so to speak. But I think the main thing to think about, and this is true just about with anything, any kind of concern that people have about naltrexone, uh, that concern is almost always actually doubly true for alcohol. Uh, you know, it's, it's alcohol that really is the central nervous system uh, uh, depressant. It's really alcohol that creates mood disorders, uh, that creates anxiety disorders, that creates sleep trouble, that creates erectile dysfunction, that creates, uh, uh, creates all these other things. So, so just, uh, I, I want people to keep in mind uh, that, that if it does cause these things, uh, it's, it's really kind of a, a short-term price to pay and then also, given the fact that you're going to be just removing this uh, just very toxic substance that causes even more of that same problem, uh, you're, you're taking that out of the equation. So I, I think uh, on, on the whole, uh, uh, people, uh, the small percentage of people who experience that, uh, they seem to think, uh, most of them think that it's okay in the short run. Uh, it's very rare for someone to not uh, kind of want to keep taking it for that particular side effect. There are more physical things that people just can't endure. But the kind of dialing back the enthusiasm for, for rewarding experiences is something that people understand is not something they're going to have to deal with forever. Yeah. Yeah, really well said. And I just want to say from my own personal experience, I would sometimes describe it like I would just feel blue the day after drinking. But what I noticed for me is it wasn't always that way. It didn't happen every time after I took naltrexone. And if I did feel blue, it would last for like a day. And then if I, you know, wasn't drinking the following day or whether I was like, I would feel fine. So um, I like to tell people kind of like you said, it's like, the, you know, any negative consequences, at least in my experience, were far worth the long-term benefits of naltrexone and the Sinclair method. So it was a, a price I was willing to pay. And my physician also told me, like you said, it's like, you have to remember alcohol is a depressant. So if you're blocking the reward you're getting from it, you could be, you know, in some sense, enhancing the displeasurable effects or the depressing effects. So that was a really interesting kind of mindset shift for me. 
Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about that, you know, in the Sinclair method world and reading the cure for alcoholism and David Sinclair's research, we talk a lot about the benefits of, you know, the day or two after you've taken naltrexone when it's washing out of your system and being proactive about doing endorphin producing activities while your receptors are super sensitized and upregulated. Is that something you uh, bear in mind in your practice and recommend to your patients? Or what would you like to say about that piece of the Sinclair method, essentially alcohol free days when naltrexone isn't in the system? Yeah, you know, I mean, there is something to that, uh, although, you know, we really don't know. Uh, it, it definitely makes sense for sure. You know, you, you kind of, the, the, you know, you're, you're, you have these kind of uh, receptors that might even be super sensitive or, or at least hypersensitive to these rewarding experiences so that on the days you're not taking the naltrexone, uh, you're going to be uh, kind of extra reinforced or extra rewarded for these uh, positive behaviors. So definitely uh, that makes sense. Uh, one of the things, a couple, I guess a, a couple of things I'll say about that. One is that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the naltrexone the itself, uh, and this is, uh, you can read this in the kind of the package insert, the, the kind of the long form information you get at the pharmacy. Uh, it, it talks about, uh, you know, that you should really get adequate blockade uh, uh, for 24 hours. You know, it's kind of a single 50 milligram dose will give you uh, adequate blockade uh, for, for uh, 24 hours. Now the active metabolite of naltrexone, which is a relevant part, kind of the parent, we say the parent molecule, which is just, would just be naltrexone itself, but it's converted into the active metabolite, which is actually you know, kind of responsible for the blockade. So the, the half-life of the active metabolite is around 13 hours. But if you wanna know how long, uh, not how long a medication works, that's a different question but how long it stays in your system. In other words, uh, how long, uh, uh, you know, kind of would we be able to detect some level of this, uh, this medicine? So it's true for all medicines, just a mathematical formula of, you know, you take half, 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 half. So basically uh, you multiply the half-life uh, times five, you know, so that's how long uh, naltrexone is gonna be in your system. But again, it's, it's very, very diminishing. And of course that last half is very, very small. So it's, so one of the kind of difficulties of that uh, idea is that you don't really know exactly how long or to what extent uh, naltrexone is bl uh, uh, blocking uh, your receptors the next day. So, uh, so it's hard to kind of uh, maybe kind of to know exactly the benefits of that. On the other hand, uh, I, sh I, I would definitely be, uh, I'm always kind of cautious about uh, discouraging activities like that. You know, in other words, I, I, I do not recommend that if someone has taken naltrexone and then they feel like running, uh, you know, I would definitely encourage them to run. Please, please go exercise. Please, uh, I, I would encourage people not to, not, I would encourage them to not avoid meaningful, pleasurable, constructive uh, activities simply because uh, they had uh, uh, taken uh, naltrexone. So uh, now, um, uh, because that really is kind of the whole point of, of the whole thing is just to start, uh, you know, building your life in, in some meaningful way. So, so I don't actively uh, kind of encourage that. Uh, but some people do that. Uh, and uh, there's certainly, uh, I don't discourage it either, this kind of timing, but I, I just, uh, the utility of it is not it's not so obvious to me, uh, but a lot of people uh, find that and it makes sense to them. And, it doesn't, and so I don't discourage it, but I would just say, if you feel like exercising, by all means do it. If you feel like going to your music class, but you've taken your naltrexone, please do not avoid you know, living uh, in these meaningful ways uh, simply because you've uh, taken your, your naltrexone. Yeah. I'm really glad you brought that up because I remember when I first started the Sinclair method and I, I learned that kind of the washout period and, you know, taking advantage of those days, I was like trying to really micromanage like, oh, I took naltrexone, I'm going out, I shouldn't dance at this wedding. And I was just like, it was so much work that I was like, screw it, I'm uh -huh. just going to do what I want to do. And people often ask me that, you know, should I avoid this activity because I took naltrexone that day? And I just, I think I totally agree with what you said about, you know, you're really, part of this journey is creating a life that revolves less around alcohol. And if that means you want to go on a walk right after you took naltrexone, Trexone, like do it, you know, it's not a big deal. That's right. And I think the micromanaging uh, is something you want to get away from uh, because I, I would say, uh, like I mentioned earlier, there are just a couple things you need to do. Be perfect with those things, but really uh, try not to micromanage it because it's kind of like, uh, 
it's kind of like the more you squeeze a bar of soap, uh, you know, the harder it is to hold. It, it's, it's kind of hard to let go of something and then also kind of micromanage it uh, at the same time. So I really kind of encourage people to, to kind of kind of make sure you do not drink unless you've taken it. Uh, but other things I would say, uh, I would just encourage people to relax around it and, and really try to uh, think about what can I do with my life? What do I want, uh, you know, what kind of relationships do I want to build? You know, those types of things and, and, and micromanage those if you must micromanage something uh, versus trying to micromanage uh, all of these Sinclair things. That's great advice. I love that perspective. Um, I have just a couple more questions for you. Do you have time to answer a couple more questions? Please, yeah. Okay. Um, so earlier we were talking about extinction and for those who aren't aware of what this is, I was just wondering, how do you define extinction or how do you explain it to your patients? And um, typically, you know, on average, how long do you see it take someone to reach that extinction point? Yeah, you know, so just, I, I sort of, uh, in, I guess you could say it's in an imprecise way, but I, I do sort of kind of speak about extinction and say uh, a person's goal kind of in the same type of way, you know, it's kind of reaching extinction versus or, or reaching someone's goal. Uh, but uh, in a, strictly speaking, they're not exactly the same thing. Extinction has a very specific meaning uh, in op operant uh, conditioning, uh, uh, where it's just, you know, you have this previously uh, rewarded uh, behavior uh, tied to this uh, re uh, reward, it's reinforced, uh, and, then, and then you no longer have that uh, uh, without, the re without the reward. So we could say that that, uh, yeah, that extinction has uh, occurred uh, because you're no longer seeing uh, the behavior with, the, with the, that reward. The, the thing, so that would be easy to say that someone has reached extinction if they were gonna be absent, uh, abstinent for the rest of their lives. So we, we could say by the classical kind of most literal definition of extinction, uh, uh, if they never drank again, we could say that, that yes, uh, that, that extinction has uh, been reached. Uh, but of course, uh, most people uh, that I work with, at least, uh, I think most people generally with the Sinclair method, uh, complete abstinence is not their goal. So there is some uh, kind of reoccurrence of, say, the behavior uh, of, of uh, drinking. Now, of course, the behavior of drinking uh, without taking the naltrexone is what we would really be concerned about. So you would have to kind of contort the definition a little bit or, or kind of the, the, say, the kind of operationally define it in a little bit different way because uh, we wouldn't be so much concerned with whether they were uh, exhibiting this behavior of drinking, uh, but whether they were uh, behaving without uh, taking this, this uh, blockade. So that's why I don't use extinction so much uh, as a term, although it's kind of a good way to think about it. And it really kind of, uh, I, I think, uh, has a flair to it that really just you know, kind of puts out this, uh, this interest that you have in your mind. So it's a good word, uh, but I really talk about, when I think about are things successful or not, have things worked out the way we hoped? Uh, I think about, I, I use the person's personal goal as that uh, kind of metric. Uh, uh, and, I, and I usually say something like, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, my kind of broad definition of success for someone is just that they have effortless control. Uh, and, uh, and I think the effortlessness is, is, is part of it, is a big part of it, you know, that they're not uh, expending so much energy to abstain or they're not expending so much energy to only have X number of drinks per week or where, whatever it might be that, you know, whatever their vision of how alcohol fits into their life that they're doing it uh, w without much fanfare, that it's just something, uh, you know, if I have a drink tomorrow, that's great. I'm not gonna spend that much time thinking about it. If I happen to have a couple, of, uh, drink a couple of days in a row because it's the holidays and that's what my family does, then that's great. And then maybe I go two weeks without drinking, but I'm also not patting myself on the back for that either. It's just not, it's just kind of a nothingness about it. Uh, so that's what I, and, and a lot of people, I have people that work in the wine industry, uh, a lot of patients that work, because uh, I work with a lot of patients in Oregon and Washington State, and they drink just about every day, uh, but that, but there's, there's no loss of control. It's exact, they're completely happy with how alcohol fits into their life. 
they're not expending energy beyond just taking the medicine, you know, the, but you know, it's just, an, it's just kind of a non-issue. So that's the way I define kind of success or kind of, I think about success for people, uh, uh, effortless control. Uh, and I would say, you know, if I just had to say some, some percentage of people, let's say, uh, uh, you know, 75% of people uh, within uh, six months will have that. Uh, and of course, it could be shorter. Uh, it could be four months or it could be uh, nine months or it could be uh, there are people there are people who are still uh, still uh, haven't kind of reached that goal of effortless control, uh, even a year into the pro uh, process. But you know, from month to month, they're showing maybe a slower reduction, 10, 15 percent, you know, something like that. So, so it, it really is about the person. I mean, I, I think it's important that the person uh, define the problem, always ask people, uh, you know, why do you, what's wrong with your drinking in the first place? Why are you, why are you even thinking something needs to be done? Uh, so it's kind of important, uh, you know, for how a person defines the issue, uh, but then also they uh, kind of define uh, what the solution or what the endpoint uh, looks like for them as well. Yeah, that's one of the great things about the Sinclair method. It's, you know, up to the person to decide they're not being prescribed, you know, never drink again and go to these meetings every day, which that works for some. I have people in my own family it's worked for, but it certainly wasn't working for me. Um, but I appreciate you saying kind of like the timeline, because, you know, as a coach, the last four plus years, I've seen the variety of people who, you know, very few who get there in three months, some six months, others two or three years still feel like they're not at the extinction point or that effortless control, but they've seen a huge reduction and they're still committed and they're still, you know, working the treatment protocol. So um, I think it, I, it's always important, I think, for people to not compare their journey to one another's because that can be discouraging too. But um, for me to see people who are, you know, long term on the Sinclair method and even if they're not totally at their goal they're you know far better than they were it's a really encouraging um thing to see that's right and i, I think too it's important to to not just uh kind of think about say the sinclair method but uh really kind of consider your entire life uh you know since since starting the sinclair uh, method you know so, uh, so that uh sure you you're 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 not where you want to be uh, with uh, effortless control, we'll say, you know, you made huge, you're freaking 75% less than, you, than when you started, but there's still occasional and you still do that. But on the other hand, you know, how is that business that you always wanted to start? How is that going? Uh, what, uh, how, did you ever finish that marathon that you were thinking? Did you reach out to that, uh, you know, a strange family member? Did you start calling your mom every Sunday? You know, it's like, so it's, I think it's important to to put the Sinclair method in the context of, of one thing about the person's life that yes, we're, we're definitely gonna be drinking less and doing all these things, but it, that, that's not really the whole point of all this. I mean, really the whole point is just whatever this whole journey is for you. You know, it's like, what's meaningful to you and what do you wanna do with your time here? And how, you know, those are the kinds of things. So yeah, Sinclair method, but also look at the, the big picture of, of what you're doing with your life and, and all the positive changes you've made in all these other ways. And the Sinclair method is still a work in progress as well. Uh, so I think that's important too, is to highlight other kind of successes that are concurrent. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's sometimes so easy to focus on the drinks and like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm still drinking three days a week and I can't get that extra alcohol free day. But yeah, looking at the other areas of the life and how it's improved by reducing drinking is so important. Um, I have one final question for you, and it's just a, a basic one, but I know when people are first learning about this method, the thought of taking naltrexone forever can be really intimidating. And so I'm just curious, you know, should people take naltrexone forever following the Sinclair method if they continue to drink? What do you tell your patients who have that as a concern? Yes, uh, 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 at least as of today, uh, again, the who, who knows what kinds of uh, break, medical breakthroughs or whatever, you know, but, uh, but uh, based on what we know today, uh, the person will have to take the medication forever prior to drinking. Uh, and that's an important kind of uh, thing to think about because, uh, of course, if you don't drink, uh, you don't take the naltrexone, so you, def you definitely don't have to take naltrexone forever. Uh, but uh, I always compare it to just like a seatbelt uh, in a car, you know, something like, uh, am I always going to have to wear a seatbelt, uh, you know, when I'm in a car? 
Well, you know, it's going to be smart. It's going to be a smart thing for you to do to, to wear a seatbelt for the rest of your life. Every time you're in a car or wear a, a, a life vest, every time you're in a boat for the rest of your life, those are going to be smart things uh, to do. And I think part of it is, unfortunately, it is sort of kind of uh, a raw deal, and, and, and uh, so to speak. Uh, you know, we know that people who develop drinking problems, uh, uh, there's kind of kind of two ideas about it, and both could be true, but we know they either have kind of like these low baseline levels of, uh, of uh, these uh, endogenous uh, uh, opioids, or they have this kind of overreactive response to drinking. In other words, you know, it's like very exciting. So for whatever reason, uh, they, uh, you know, kind of, you, you, you kind of uh, didn't, it, you didn't get the, you know, a, a good hand dealt to you as far as uh, this is concerned. And that is just something that, uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, it's many people have to, to accept certain things like that, I would say, you know, whether it could be wearing glasses, or, you know, am I going to have to avoid peanuts for the rest of my life? If I have a peanut allergy. Yeah, you know, that's, that's too bad. You're, you're, you're really going to be smart. It's gonna be really smart for you to do that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but again, it always, the, the first decision is to have a drink. So, uh, you know, so if you decide to have a drink, you're, you're going to want to proceed that uh, with the naltrexone and you're going to want to do that for the rest of your life. And, and really, uh, thank goodness that is an option. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's the real miracle is that this option is available uh, versus, you know, fighting these battles in your head for the rest of your life and going to meetings or whatever it might be. But it, but it is, yeah, it's, you're, it, you know, because the thing is, uh, by, by blocking the, the endorphin release and, and kind of disentangling the association between the behavior and the reward, yes, you're, you're uh, at a neurological level, those, those associations are weakening and then finally, you know, they, they're no longer existing. But the underlying uh, ge genetic predisposition that created that, uh, the, you know, kind of the ease at which, uh, and the strength at which those associations formed in the first place, that's still there. Nothing has changed about that. So uh, if you were to start drinking again, uh, uh, you would essentially be primed uh, to, to recreate uh, the same problem for yourself. Yeah, and that's what I've seen, you know, in general, I think in the five years or so I've been in this space, I've had a few people reach out to me and say, oh, I can drink now on holidays without naltrexone and I don't have an issue. But the vast majority of people who have reached out to me who drank without it have relearned it. And whether it took a couple of weeks or a couple of months, they wound up back where they were when they started TSM. And I know for me, I haven't drank in four years, but if I were ever going to, I would most certainly take naltrexone before just because, uh -huh. like you said, I don't trust my brain. Like I, I know it would go back to that place, even though I've done a lot of work and healing and feel totally effortly, effortlessly in control of my drinking, I yeah. know where it would go back to in just a matter of time. So that's right, because because the, the conditions you've created for yourself have nothing to do with, uh, you know, the fact that at this neurological level, it's going to start recreating that same thing, you know, like, like the progress that you've made in all these particular areas, they, they're just kind of irrelevant to the fact that, uh, you know, those, those pathways would just recreate themselves. I do want to say too, another thing, it's really a, a, a bad way to think about uh, risk, uh, uh, to, to think about outcomes is really kind of a bad way to think about risk because you can certainly drive a long time without wearing a seatbelt. And uh, to celebrate that, uh, as a uh, kind of victory and rational behavior, I, I don't think it's such a such a great idea. So it's, it's certain because things work until they don't. Uh, so it's certainly possible that people who are uh, reached extinction and then can drink and, and on holidays without the naltrexone, whether that's a good idea, it's hard to say. But but uh, I, I uh, when when risk is involved, I, I think about. Kind of the process or, or kind of the reasoning behind it versus any given outcome because uh, it could only be a matter of time before circumstances uh, are different and uh, your luck runs out essentially. Yeah, I, I totally agree. This has been an awesome talk. I know when we first started, I was like 45 minutes, but I think we've gone like an hour or more just because I feel like I could ask you 10 more questions. But um, I want to tell people, you know, where they can find you and have you speak a little bit more about SinclairMethod.org. But is there anything else you wanted to say before we kind of wrapped up the conversation? Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, I'll be happy to answer uh, 10 more questions next time. Uh, I, I, uh, I, my enthusiasm for Sinclair Method uh, uh, never kind of uh, wanes. And uh, 
Uh, I'm always uh, happy to talk about it. I would just say, uh, I guess the main thing, uh, or a cer certainly an important thing, is that uh, I personally would set the bar very low for uh, trying the Sinclair method uh, uh, in terms of, you know, if you just think you're drinking a little bit more, if it's just, uh, it's not this idea that, you know, you have to, certainly that you have to hit rock bottom, or you have to wait till your spouse threatens divorce, or your boss speaks to, you know, something like that, you know, you don't, it's not really a good idea, I don't think, to wait uh, until something bad happens or you cross some line like that, because it really is a well-tolerated medication. It really is easy. And if you just want to try it, so you have to think, uh, I, I, I just, uh, I would say, I would just encourage people to whatever they have in their mind as uh, some kind of threshold of severity, uh, uh, given the ease of this treatment and the safety and all the convenience and all these things, you can probably uh, lower that bar a little bit and uh, kind of head off a problem before it gets uh, too big. Absolutely. I've heard people say who are on the Sinclair method, like, man, if I would have known about this 10 years ago, like I could have saved myself a lot of heartache. And I think that's one of the great things about it. It will work for the spectrum of alcohol use disorder severity. And you don't have to wait for that, you know, rock bottom or life in disarray. It's, you can start it at any point in time. And I've seen people at, you know, the, the spectrum, the different like mild, moderate to severe alcohol use disorder do well on the Sinclair method. So thank you for saying that. So um, I've linked Sinclair, I'll link the SinclairMethod.org below. Um, did you want to tell us a bit about what people can expect when coming to the website and working with you guys? Yeah, well, uh, you know, of course, we have a lot of information on there uh, about uh, the Sinclair Method. Uh, uh, there's some videos, a lot of uh, 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 published, uh, you know, kind of scientific uh, articles about it. Uh, we have, uh, I think everyone, uh, uh, most of the crew has, most of the providers, the four of us at least, have been there almost from the beginning. Uh, so uh, really, uh, uh, lots of experience. It's, it's uh, we're really kind of, uh, I, I don't think you're going to find a group of people who have seen more people. And of course, we talk to each other about it, share our experiences. So you're really in great hands and everyone uh, is just uh, just excited to, to help you. You know, it, it's really nice if you've worked in the field of addiction very long, which is, can be a very pessimistic world uh, uh, because uh, for so long, there just weren't many treatments that were that were all that effective. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a just a just a kind of a professional kind of pleasure to really work uh, with the Sinclair method because it really is so helpful, and we just see so many people, uh, 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 you know, uh, benefit from it. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard that from others as well who've kind of been in their traditional addiction treatment space and then come over to this. It's like a night and day difference where the majority of people are not succeeding over there versus here the majority of people are. So thank you so much, Brian, for taking time to mm -hmm. chat with me. I will probably ask you to come back again at some point because I do have a lot more questions for you. But just thank you for the work you're doing. And again, you guys can visit him at SinclairMethod.org. Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, thank you very much.